No? You hear me in the back? All right, great, thanks. Tim, thank you for that. Um, thank you for having me. <coughs> Dr. Archer, where are you? I, I know you were here a second ago. Maybe you're not here anymore. There he is. Dr. Archer, thank you for having me. Your whole team, staff, administration, I see so many of you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, you know, first, y you all are the leadership of this program. And, and I was talking to Tim a little bit before. You've taken this to new heights. I was here in these, these seats, and it's a lot of what I'm going to talk about. But uh, the program was okay back then. It was good, right? Um, I freely say that this, this class gets better every and every year, ev every year over and over, and this is no exception. This is the best class I've seen come out of here. Spent a lot of time with you, and um, just really excited about where this has gone. So thank you for your leadership, and, and frankly, I'm, I'm excited to just be part of it in some small way. Um, I'm honored to be here, and I use that word. A lot of people say they're honored to be here, I'm sure, but again, sitting in your seats, I was watching and attending the Ring Speaker Series. Um, and 19 years later, uh, I'm back here. So it's really cool for me, and I, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate that invitation. Dr. Lang asked me to come, and I immediately accepted, and that's not like me. Um, I booked the date immediately because I figured he could think about that for a few minutes and realize how unremarkable his former student's story really is. So um, I jumped in quick, and um, again, glad, I, glad I'm here. I'm also honored to be Part of the board, as Tim mentioned, part of the executive committee now, I get to see the behind the scenes, get to understand the numbers, the talent, the, the dollars behind this organization. Um, and that's been great. But what I'll tell you the most rewarding thing is, and you hear this, that boy, when you give in, you get more out, right? But it's true when it, when it really comes to the, to the mentee-mentor relationships. And I've been blessed over the last number of years that I've had four or five different mentees technically in the program, they've all become good friends. And uh, Jonathan's no different. I've really enjoyed spending time with you. You know, Jonathan's a fun guy, he's a smart guy. I guarantee these two don't sit in the front row normally. <laughs> but I appreciate that, guys. Um, do you? Do they? All right, good, I love it. Um, but I'm really excited to see where you go with your career because we, we've spent a lot of time together and, I, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. But, I can't encourage you all enough, no matter what program you're in right now or what you're doing, where you're going to go, to as soon as you leave, to get right back into this program some way. Attend a regional event, get in the, the, uh, the first council, is that the Bergstrom Council? Um, it's a nominal investment and it's just, it just pays dividends. And this group, this leadership team wants you back in. And, and when I think about it, it's somewhat selfish, if I, if I really admit it, because I'm getting to meet the next generation of leaders of the real estate industry. And it's a small industry, okay? And um, so if I get to build a relationship with you now, I win later because you, some of you heard me say, we're gonna be doing deals together. And, and you know, you're like, yeah, sure, Scott, we're, we're all gonna be doing deals together. It's true, it's very true. I've seen it happen year after year. And I don't just mean me and Aaron Banks, where's Aaron? Delighted, just absolutely excited that Aaron's coming on board with Styles in a couple of months. Um, Aaron just can't tell you how excited we are, but um, I don't mean that. I mean, wherever you guys end up, um, we're gonna be touching deals. We're gonna be touching each other in some way. It's, um, so getting to know you now is really to my advantage. Um, okay, so I've got a, uh, a brief agenda here I'll show you. This is not necessarily indicative of my PowerPoint skills, but close, it gets better. Um, when Dr. Ling, again, when he asked me what I wanted, uh, if I'd come here, he, didn't, he gave me no rules or guidelines, he said go watch a couple videos online. Well, these things are an hour and a half long, so I didn't watch too many videos. But I did talk to a couple people, and you all are more technically savvy and astute than I ever was coming out of here, okay? You know real estate, you know a lot about real estate. You're gonna go, learn a whole ton more. But um, it's late in the year, and I didn't think me getting up here and talking about a deal or a case study or how to invest in retail real estate or otherwise was as applicable perhaps as my background, my path, again, having sit in your, in your seats. Um, I wanna share some of that and, and see if it's worthwhile, right? I've certainly had some ups, some downs, some failures. Maybe there's some lessons in there. Um, I'll talk to you about styles, I'll tell you about our structure, 
We'll use some deals, a couple of examples of some relevant deals right now. I'm going to pick one of the things we do. We do a lot of different things, and, it's, and it's, um, I'm going to talk today about development. And we play in three different food groups, retail, office, uh, multifamily. And each one of those are, are, have something going on with them today that, that you all understand, but I'll, I'll try to give you some examples by, by showing you some real life projects. And then for lack of a better term, because I, boy, I'm not here to um, tell you anything that I've done is certainly right. I, hopefully I'll tell you a few things I've done wrong, but um, you know, some advice. And, and not only for me at the end, I'll, I'll walk through some bullet points that are more, hopefully a little more life than real estate actually. But um, <clears throat> I found an old video, it's only about three years old of Terry Styles. And uh, Terry, Style, uh, Terry Styles passed September 11th of this past year, the day after the hurricane. It was a major loss for our company, major loss for me personally. And uh, thank you so much to the, all the leadership team here for honoring him at the annual meeting this year. That's fantastic. That really meant a lot to us and the, and the Styles family. But, but cool clip. And, I, and when I get to that, I'll call out a couple things for you to listen to before I play it. It's a four or five minute clip. And there's some really good life lessons in there. And really my point of showing that is that I want every one of you to find someone like a Terry Styles, whether they're going to be your partner, whether they're going to be your boss, whether they're going to be your mentor. Um, he's got some good stuff to say there. So, so we'll go through that. Um, does that sound all right? So um, everybody says this too, I bet, but please let's keep it casual, conversational. Um, just interrupt me. I'd, I'd much rather do that. We can, we can talk through questions now. If I get over, over time, which would be hard to believe. When I heard an hour and a half, I was like, oh my God, poor souls. Um, <laughs> so if we, if we can talk a little bit, it'd be awesome. So we just had a really great session with, with a great group. Uh, unbelievable questions. I mean, put me on the spot a little bit. It was, it was tough, but I, but I love that. And so if we can do some of that, it'd be great. Um, I'll start with my background, and I'll try to be brief um, early on, which is, I came to UF in 1991. They were golden years. It was the Spurrier years. I had way more fun than anybody should have been allowed to have in college. I readily admit it. Um, I dug myself out of a hole my, after my second semester, joining a fraternity grade-wise. Um, just, just loved being here for four years. And you know, I, some of these things, your choices in life just happen, right? And I'm sitting in the fraternity house one day, and I thought I was going to be an engineer, you know, applying to schools. I liked math a lot, but I didn't know what that meant. And I'm talking to one of the older guys, and he's like, listen, I'm in business, and uh, here's the reasons why I think business is a great approach. You've got all these opportunities you can do from consulting to finance, and if you're going to be in business, you should go finance. It's concrete. Um, it's, it's, it's the best of the majors. So, you know, I'm pretty impressionable, I guess. I'm like, I'm going business. I'm going finance, right? And I, I started doing a little diligence, but, you know, back then, you applied into your college after your sophomore year. So went into the business school, and I found a guy named Dr. Dave Brown. Anybody have him? So we, we called it debt back then. Now it's, now it's what? Um, fixed income, right? It's, boy, it's getting savvy around here. So um, Dave Brown was awesome. He was my favorite teacher of all undergrad, uh, undergrad. And he left for a little while, right? Does anybody know that? And he went private sector, and now he's back. Um, it's probably years ago since he's been back. But my point is, um, I loved his class, I got to know him, and he talked me out of law school, okay? I, business guy, I liked finance, but hey, like a lot of people, doc, I'm gonna go to law school, you wanna write me a letter of recommendation? And he like flipped out on me. He's like, we got way too many attorneys, don't do it, Scott. Um, I see that you like business, you're gonna be better suited there. And um, he talked me out of law school, right? I'd already taken the LSAT, and he talked me out of law school. Um, and I'm grateful for that, not because there's anything wrong with, with the law, Ben, I said this to you before, but um, I would have been miserable. I work with attorneys every day, and I, I would have been miserable at it. The education would have been fantastic. You can go do a lot of things with that education, but, but that was, that was the, the short advice there, and it really, really led me the right, <clears throat> the right path. Um, I also had a fraternity brother who was working at Merrill Lynch, and internships were not as, as prevalent and critical as they are right now to you all, okay? That was my internship. I worked two years, my junior, senior year, um, both years at Merrill Lynch. Um, one, it was great experience. It was life experience. I was learning what I was learning. Two, it was a job, right? And I was getting paid at most of that second year, probably. And um, life experience. It pulled me after graduation pretty much to that field. Okay, so I, 
I said, listen, um, I'm going to go interview with the banks. I interviewed with Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, I think it was Smith Barney at the time, um, Prudential Securities right next to my house, Town Center Mall in Boca Raton. And um, I took the job, and I hated it from the day I started. And it wasn't just the cold calling, okay? It was, I got hung up on 99 out of 100 times, right? I'd cold call in the mornings. I'd be calling Europe. I'd be calling all over the place for this broker who's sitting on top of me listening to my pitch. It was miserable. And then in the second half of the day, I'd study for my Series 7 test to get licensed. And um, that was with a group of people. Never made any connections there. I certainly didn't connect with my boss. I mean, I, I, we didn't like each other, it felt like. No investment in me, no, no mentoring. And, you know, you can't make this stuff up. I was praying about it. I, I was, you know, man, I'm not, I'm not in the right spot. I felt really good about my degree. Finance guy, UF. Came out, I'm working here. I just felt terrible. Fire alarm goes off. We go downstairs, empties the building out. You've all been in this situation. I, I literally am not talking to anybody because I don't even know anybody three months in. And I'm talking to the firefighter. And I'm like, is there a fire? Is it an alarm? Is it a test? And he goes, it's neither, and we can't figure it out. Another hour goes by. I'm really thinking, wise or not, I walk upstairs, and I say, Bob, <clears throat> I'm out of here. I, I, I can't do this. It's not my thing. You want my two weeks' notice? And he's like, get the hell out. Okay, so I, I tell you that because, you know, again, I'm coming out, I'm feeling really high, I'm a, I'm a complete failure, right? My parents had, had already told me, you're not moving back in with us, right? So get, get an apartment, I got a roommate, and all of a sudden I'm out of a job already, three months in. And um, I wouldn't have done that if I didn't know there was something else out there that was interesting. My roommate's older sister, former Gator, ran the accounting and finance department at Sony, and so... That's really my official first job, but that, that's the true story. Um, and I walked into this job, and, and what I figured out pretty quickly was really more accounting than finance, okay? It wasn't, wasn't really what I was looking to do, but I just come off this failure, right? And I put my head down and just started grinding, all right, and working my tail off. And even if it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do, the company was treating me really well. Right? I, was tr I started traveling with them back and forth to the headquarters in New Jersey, I'd interact with the expatriates that would come over from Japan to this manufacturing facility. I'd go out at night with them drinking sake and playing cards. I mean, they had broken English. I was learning about their culture, them about America. It was, in, in some ways, it was really, really pretty cool. Um, and, and, and so I felt really good about the company, but I, I did not like what I, I was doing, but I knew I had to grind it out. And about three years in, I'd just gotten married. So this was 1997. Spring of 1997, I said to my wife, um, I'm gonna make a switch. I gotta, I gotta make a switch. I'm interested in real estate. Not really sure what that means. I can't tell it to you, but I know I need to use a grad program to make the jump, to make the change. And remember, coming into grad programs back then, it was typical to have at least two years of, of work experience, okay? And for all the reasons we know, and I actually love the plan now, how a lot of you are going straight through, but that was the case. And so, <clears throat> um, you can imagine that conversation. I went to my wife and I said, listen, you stay here in this underpaying first grade teacher job, which is so awesome, and I'm going back to the University of Florida, <laughs> right? And she's like, oh, yeah, okay, that's, that sounds awesome. And th but, but she supported me and that's what we did. And um, I lived up here while she lived in South Florida and we commuted a lot. But um, first day I get up here for the program, it's like a Thursday, and we're going to start classes on Monday, and I go to find Dr. Ling. And you can imagine, I'm, I'm not looking for the same demographic that I found, you know, six foot three, flowing white locks, um, Dr. Ling, when he opened his door. And my recollection, at least, is that I walked in, and I, I didn't even, you know, tell him my name. I just said, Dr. Ling, I'm starting a program on Monday. I want to know who's coming here. I want to know who's recruiting. I want to know who's going to talk to us. And I bellish a little bit because he's not here maybe, but, but the point was I remember how patient he was with me, he made me introduce myself, um, and then went on to reassure me that this was gonna be an awesome year. It was gonna be a great program, you're gonna learn a lot, but you're gonna meet a lot of people. And this network is, is really strong. So, um, you know, we, from there, I, um, I started in the program, we had a great time. Um, the one thing I wanted to share on that um, was that, I, I guess really the reason for that story is that 
that's the way I treated this year. I talked to everybody, anybody that would come through. And it was 1999, it was a good time to be coming out. So a lot of people were weighing multiple offers, but I was flying all over the place. I was part of the MBA class, but I was really associated most with the real estate group. I had all my classes with the real estate folks. And, but because I was part of the MBA, I was flying to Dallas to talk to EDS, Ross Perot's old company, to Atlanta to talk to the consulting groups, South Florida, my hometown, to talk to the brokerage shops. And, and case in point, racetrack gas stations, everybody know racetrack? They come through and I'm in the career placement office and nobody signed up for them, right? Well, I signed up for everybody. Anybody that would come through to talk to me, I talked to. And I put my name down. I was the only person to interview with them that day out of the whole program. And my recollection, and I think it's accurate, is that the offer they gave me was the highest offer of, of anybody in the real estate program that year from racetrack gas stations, right? To go be a site selection guy for the state of Florida. That was, that was gonna be the territory. Fresh out of school, go drive around, we give you a car and an allowance and hotel bills and whatever and go, go find us sites, right? And um, I ended up turning that down because it, you know, it didn't feel like exactly what I wanted to do, but it, but it goes to show you that it was a real opportunity for somebody. <clears throat> um, Styles was the last group that I interviewed with and Jeremy Anderson, who's my absolute best friend from high school, college roommates, best men at each other's weddings. He was in this program, this program, a year prior to me, had started at Styles, And he said, you gotta come down here, you gotta meet these guys. Um, we need another analyst. And um, came down, I met Jim Stein, who's many of you know, he's the, he's the president of Ram Realty. He was our chief investment officer for, you know, probably 15 years, he was at Styles for 25 years. And Rocco Ferrer, who's our chief investment officer today. And, I met those two guys, I immediately was attracted to them. I, there was something that pulled me in. They were young and aggressive. I hadn't met Terry Styles or any of them, but they told me what they were doing, and my friend Jeremy um, had told me what they were doing. And I got the lowest offer of the five offers I had from Styles. So again, I'm back to my wife, telling her I'm gonna take the lowest offer I got from this group down in Fort Lauderdale, which I thought was a construction company. I grew up in South Florida. I didn't know who Styles really was but I was attracted to their platform and to these, to these two guys that I thought were gonna spend time with me and invest in me, and, and it's what they did. And, I, and so I took that job, and um, I don't wanna say it's unique, but it's certainly not common to spend your first 19 years at, at one spot, and we'll talk about that. Um, I'll tell you one other story real quick before we get into that, before we get into styles. Um, it was really cool, it was 1999, it was the spring, my last semester here, Warren Buffett comes to campus. And you know, this is the world's greatest investor, right? He's coming to the University of Florida. And he came just to talk to the business school and the students. So I, you know, I can't remember what room it was at. I don't know, Dr. Archer, if you were there or not. I don't know where we were meeting, but it, it might have been 300 people. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a big venue. Maybe it was more than that. It was? Yeah, so that's probably even less than that. Okay. So um, he comes, and uh, I'm really excited. I'm a finance guy. I'm like, wow, it's Warren Buffett here. And, you know, he wasn't here to, to talk about his stories and all the great stuff he'd done. He took a lot of cool questions about Jack Welch and Roberto Gazzetta and other famous CEOs he'd worked with, and that was fun to listen to. But he was there to give us some perspective, and he was trying to do it through a series of stories. And I always remembered this one all the way through, and, he, and, and I'll butcher it a little bit, and I'll try to tell it quickly, but he stood on stage with this small venue, and he, he said, um, okay, everybody in this room is a marble, okay, your life is a marble, and I'm up here with the grand bag of marbles that is reflective of everybody in the world, okay, I got, the, I got everybody in this bag, and I'm gonna give you an opportunity, march up here down the aisle one by one, trade in your marble for an opportunity at any of these other marbles, okay? Just, you gotta trade in yours, you get to pick one back out. I'll give you a thousand opportunities to do that. I'll give you a million opportunities to come up here and trade out your marble for somebody else's. And he said, would you do that? It's real simple. And, um, you know, maybe a second he waits and he goes, the answer is absolutely not. You would never trade in your marble. He goes, I don't know any of you. I don't know a single one of you besides, I think it was Dr. Radcliffe was his friend. 
And uh, he said, but what I know <clears throat> is that you're at a major institute of learning in the United States of America. You've got suits on this morning. You've, I know you've eaten because there's a breakfast buffet in the back. And you are in the top 1% of this world. Top 1% of the world socioeconomically, right? Whatever, whatever he's using, top 1% of the world. That's all I remembered. And I don't know what I was thinking at the time. Like, man, I wish I had a better job offer. I didn't have student loans or I, I, whatever stress was on me. That hit me right in the face. And his point that he went on to clarify was, whatever you guys are thinking you want to do, whatever it is, go do it. Because you can do it. You have the opportunity. Just by the fact that you're in this room and what you're doing, and I know very little about you, but I know that, that you can do that. So everyone in here has that same opportunity. It would have sounded a lot better coming from Warren Buffett, trust me, but, but that's, that's what I wanted to relay. <clears throat> um, let's do this. More PowerPoint skills. Um, so I just said a second ago that it's, it's kind of, um, it's certainly not unique. That's not the right word, but I, I just, most people will move around a little bit to be able to find the opportunity to round out their skill sets. We just talked about this a little bit in the small session. And um, this company, Styles, has, has afforded me the opportunities, okay? They've given me a path to move around every two, three, four, five years, um, and we'll see where it takes me next. But, you know, I, I started at Styles. I was an analyst, and I know a lot of you all are working on analyst positions. A lot of your, your you know, predecessors and classes have jumped into analyst positions. I don't think there's any other, any better way to start in the business, okay? Even if you're in the brokerage side, or, or yet somehow you're exposed to the numbers. You've got to know the numbers. You've got to spend a lot of time in your classes on them. You're solid, I know, based on what you do. But you've got to understand the root of, of how to analyze real estate. And for me, this was two straight years of just grinding it out from everything from development pro formas to cash, tenure cash flows, refinancing opportunities, investment sale packages, um, asset management lease obligation analysis, um, and, and two years I, I turned around and I, I don't even know what I knew, but it was a lot. And, and what you're looking for is volume. So wherever you start in this business, and again, I don't want to counter what I always tell everybody, just get in. Get in the business with somebody who's going to teach you and spend time with you. But then second to that, find volume, find transactions, because that's how you're going to learn. Um, and, and seek that out. I moved from there in our shop, kind of a natural progression to asset management. <clears throat> and that role is having a portfolio of properties and leading the team to, to basically try to maximize you know, those assets. And so you're working with accountants and you're working with leasing agents and you're working with property managers and you're getting to know what they do pretty closely because you're, you're leading that team. Um, but you're also really understanding the root uh, and the lifeblood of real estate, which is your tenants, right? If you don't have paying tenants that, that you can attract and retain and keep happy, make sure you, you, you're legally covered with them, make sure you got a good lease document, then there's no reason to own a building, right? There's, there's nothing there. This is your cash flow, this is your lifeblood. And that's what I learned. I can tell you of, of this list of, of uh, positions, the position um, that I disliked the most was asset management. It's a headaches, tenants, dealing with tenants. It's like major headaches. Um, but the position I learned the most of everything on here, asset management. Never shy away from an asset management position if you, if you see one. <clears throat> um, from there, uh, your, your good buddy and mine, my close friend, I hope I see him tonight, fine, uh, Nick Banks was our director of I forget what we called it, like sales and finance maybe, but, but finance and dispositions. And um, he sat next to me for a couple years. And uh, he moved on to much, much greener pastures, doing awesome things, I'm so proud of that guy. Um, but that opened a position for me, right? There's, there's just a fortuitous opportunity for me to continue to advance my career after a couple years in asset management. And, I, and Rocco Ferrer, Jim Stein, they gave me the opportunity to move into Nick's position. And that was, um, Every property we were doing, we were blowing and going at the time. New financing, construction financing, new permanent debt, okay? All the life companies, all those relationships that I learned then, I still have today. The majority of them are still actively in those, those roles, those businesses. 
unbelievable relationship development that I learned on the finance side, all the investment broker community, um, know all those guys still today, guys and girls. Um, almost became an attorney because you're, you're negotiating documents, learning about loan documents, what's important, what's not, what, what's gonna save your butt when your loan starts, when your deal starts changing, right? Um, how to negotiate a transaction. So, so back when I was an analyst, I saw all these transactions, but I wasn't negotiating them. I wasn't documenting them. And that's what I was doing in this position. Wore that hat, as I, as I say. And then, biggest change in my career uh, uh, by far, Jim Stein came to me and he said, listen, um, I want you to physically move from this side of the office all the way, way over there, and get into development. Okay, we need somebody. We're not quite sure where you're gonna go over here, your career path anyways. Um, and if you're gonna be with Styles, you gotta learn the development business. And I said, Jim, I'm a finance guy, man. I, I don't get my fingers dirty. I don't like construction, I don't have a hard hat, I don't have any cool boots, right? I'm, I'm just, I'm not doing that. I'm uncomfortable. And, and Jim's got a way, if you get to know Jim or you guys know him, Ben, you work for him, I think. Um, tilted his glasses down, he said, you're going over to development. And um, it was pretty clear, and, and by the way, you, you guys heard me before, I trusted Jim. He's one of my best friends in life today. Um, my biggest mentor I've ever had in, in my career. <clears throat> and, um, and I did it. And it was totally uncomfortable. Um, I was starting my career over. I had to learn everything new. Water and sewer, you know, plans, construction guys sitting in a trailer, industrial sites. Uh, it, it's, um, it was kind of a short-lived hat, but I, I worked on four different development projects in that time. And uh, probably the biggest learning curve I had at that point. I worked for a great guy named Denny O'Shea just really would take the time to sit with me on any issue from environmental to entitlements. He was, uh, he was an unbelievable guide. And again, it takes somebody like that to invest in you and spend the time and teach you. Um, from there, quickly, I, you know, th the relevant point of this next position is that they gave me a territory, West Palm Beach North for Styles, and that meant up to Orlando at the time. Um, and it was business development. It was all right, we're blowing and going, we're growing, we're gonna create these city leader positions, we're just gonna be feeding a pipeline of development and acquisitions. And one year into that, felt really good about myself, got this cool new role, um, got an expense account, right? And all of a sudden, 2008, 2009, and the world crashed. And I've never been so scared, it was, it was tough times, you guys have all heard about it. Um, but I had to swing my legs off the bed every morning and go, where am I gonna go spend my time? And what that meant was, how do I bring a dollar into this company? My other positions had been, somebody was out there rainmaking, right? And I was, I was trying to execute or analyze or, or manage. And all of a sudden, I, I had to go bring business in the door. And it wasn't just Terry Styles feeding us. It was a number of us out there in really tough times trying to figure out what to do. So I meant cross-selling your services, property management and leasing construction, a development deal that might take place three years later, right when you need dollars today. But the whole goal of this, and the point I bring it up is, it's all about relationships. And so every day, what I would tell myself is I've gotta go meet one new person that's gonna to talk to me, that's gonna give me 10 minutes. I, and I got really good at a pitch, right? I, I was pitching everything. So sales, being uncomfortable, but getting out there and figuring out how you bring business in the door. It's, 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 critical at some point in your career, and it'll happen sooner than later for this group, this, this group of type A's, okay? Um, talking about relationships, Publix came to us in 2000, late 2011 and said, listen, we're gonna go from South Carolina to North Carolina, we're keeping a very top secret. We don't want people up there tying up sites and spoiling our business plan, <clears throat> but we're gonna move in in a major way, and, we, and you're you know, 25 year at the time, Publix developers come up there with us, we'll protect you, find sites, it'll be awesome, right? So we said yes, I said yes. Um, I didn't move, but I lived on a plane for four years. And it was, it was difficult, even with Publix in tow. We ended up doing six Publix deals to date. We've done some other product types I'll show you later. Um, unbelievable growing market, but I, I no longer had Styles reputation behind me like I did in West Palm Beach. Nobody knew Styles up there, very, very few. And so now all of a sudden, just another level of business development. I had to go build a team, I had to open an office. 
We execute it in a foreign land. We're getting entitlements from a different municipality. So again, all this is to say that, that you've got to seek out these opportunities to, to wear different hats, okay, and, and grow your skill set. Development is, is kind of, it's an easy one to talk about in that regard. It's not easy to execute, but it's because you, you really are a jack of all trades. You become this master of nothing, right? You lead a team of, of the best professionals. You want to get the best land use council. You want to get the best civil engineer and contractor. Um, but you become a jack of trades. And that's kind of what Styles has taught me is to, is to become this jack of trades. And then Terry would tell you long before he got sick, long before he knew he wasn't going to be around, um, that he needed a succession plan. He wanted to build a 100-year company. And we're about 67 years into that plan. And um, his president, Doug Egan, had been our president for 20 years with the company 37 years. And it was time for him to retire. And uh, absolutely honored that him and, and his son, our CEO today, asked me to come back home, effectively, and become president of the company. And, what that really meant was, you know, we're 320 people strong. You'll hear T Terry talk about his people later. It's a lot of people, right? It's a lot of people issues. It's a lot of strategy with people. Where do we put people, right? Positions, geography, um, a little bit of, of learning, uh, you know, how to manage a bottom line in North Carolina became a big goal of mine, big hurdle for me to come back and learn how to manage a bottom line um, for the entire corporation, you'll see all the things we do. So that's where we are today. And again, I, I said before, we'll see where, where it all goes next. Um, so pretty simple. Um, any questions at this point before I jump into some of those? Yeah, from a volume perspective, you've been in the three years that you've been in North Carolina, you've been six deals. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, not familiar with development. Is that a lot? Yeah. So, so great question. Boy, I, you know. You talk about development, and even back to my comment about when you first get into the business, you want to see transactions, right? You want to learn a lot. We've, we've been successful in bringing incredible talent out of this same program straight into development, but what happens is you're seeing one piece of one deal, okay? If you're straight out of school, you're seeing one piece of that one deal for three or four years, and that's what you're getting good at. You might get damn good at that one piece, but that's it. And so um, development takes forever. Right? From the time you identify a site to put it under contract, to work on entitlements, to finally putting a shovel on the ground, it's probably anywhere from a year to, to five years, depending on the project. Okay? And with public deals, those are small deals. So you'd say, shoot, you should be, you should be able to crank those things out, right? That was our, that was our plan. But you know, again, you, you meet obstacles. And that can be the government, that can be landowners, it can be construction costs, whatever it might be. So um, I would tell you, yeah, that's, that was, um, that met our expectations. It probably at first felt lighter than what we wanted to do based on this awesome request from Publix to come up and be our guys, right? But Publix found it harder to do business up there than they thought too. They got major competition, sites are expensive, all, all the other stuff. So um, it's a good question though. Yeah, anybody else? I'm gonna jump into some um, some projects and and you know I, I, I talked about well first of all I'm sorry before I do that this is a little crude but this gives you a, just a, a sense of the umbrella that Styles Corporation is we've got a bunch of separate functions that we do as as companies okay and, and you kind of see architecture construction TI property management and leasing and brokerage those are what we call our service businesses <clears throat> they probably do any one of them will tell you 75% or more third-party work, 25% our own shops investments. Okay, so our development group is not taking up the majority of our construction group's time. That flip-flopped on its head probably a dozen years ago. When Terry really set up this company, the other three groups are our investment group, and, and that's, that's a smaller portion numbers-wise. When, when times are like they are today, it's a significantly higher portion of our, our revenues and profits. Um, but Terry set this up really for two reasons. And, you know, the, the first is what I'll call quality control, security, right? He, he's starting in the development business. He's, he's already been a, a small time contractor. And he says, listen, I'm signing off on bonds to be able to build. I'm signing off on personal guarantees with the banks. I've got a lot of risk. If I'm going to take on all this risk, I want my guys and girls building it, designing it, Property management, uh, property managing it, leasing 
the buildings, and um, so that's one. And then two, you know, Terry was smart enough, he'd been through some ups and downs, that he knew he had to diversify what we were doing. If it was all just an investment platform, stuff can go south, and, and we all see it. A lot of our competition in this last time around went south. Um, by having other companies, you know, some, some of the guys, somebody was talking about, forgive me, um, there's a Joe that's going to work for Graystar, right? They've got an enormous property management portfolio, much bigger than their, their development side, right? They built a, a, a heck of a business and feels pretty insulated when, when the economy does move. Um, and that's what Terry has tried to build. That's something that we are very focused on, especially at peak of market right now, which we can talk a little bit about, that these other companies can provide fee revenue sources when you really need them. And you can blow them up, you can build them when, the, when times change as well, right? You can really focus on them, especially property management. So um, that's, that's who we are and what we're doing. Um, Styles gets a reputation, I think, um, for, for be, you know, kind of solely being uh, downtown Fort Lauderdale developers. And we're proud of that reputation. We, we've done, you know, four million square feet, I think this says, of office and residential. And what's not shown here is about another million square feet that's going in the ground right now. Um, beyond what we're doing, you're gonna see the skyline double in the next two years. There's just an enormous amount of properties, mostly multifamily, high rise, that's going on in downtown Fort Lauderdale. But what we also do is we're, we're pretty spread out across the state. We've done a lot of business from Jacksonville to you know, down the Southwest Coast. Um, and then over the last, you know, I told you we went into Charlotte in 2011. We've been in Nashville a little longer than that. But those Southeastern cities are gonna be every bit as bit as big as anything we're doing in Florida going forward. They're growing, there's jobs, they got all the components, okay? Charlotte, Raleigh, Nashville, they're three of the most exciting cities in the United States. And so we're spending a lot of time and resources and investment dollars there. We're now down in Charleston, South Carolina. Anybody go there ever? Uh, anybody like food or drinks? Um, it's like the coolest city, man. It is, uh, you want really good food, great bars, uh, Charleston. So we're just excited we've got a Publix deal there now so we can go visit Charleston. Um, on the right there, it's just our tagline, invest, build, manage. Kind of shows the life cycle of a project. And um, again, the, the concept that we try to do a lot, not everything, but a lot of the things internally. These next couple of slides are really important. I'll go quick through them, but um, <clears throat> in this business, it's all about your partners. It's all about your capital. It's all about repeat business, long time clients. Okay, and on the top, we, I just show number of the banks that we do business with that have been there for us. Terry Styles passes away in September. We, we had every one of these people at, it, at his funeral, right? We're there for you. We know what he's built. We know your team. We're with you. Um, almost, almost emotion evoking uh, how great our partnerships are. Down below there, you see clients and tenants. Um, little known probably, we do as many car dealerships or more than anybody in the state. Ground up construction, just repeat business. It's, it's, it's like crazy how, how much money these car dealership guys are making and that they spend on their facilities. Who knows in five years when cars go away, right? Is it, but um, but we, we've got a tremendous amount of business through car dealerships, furniture stores. El Dorado, we do every El Dorado. I don't know if you guys know those or not. They're big in South Florida. They're creeping up into Tampa. Um, city furniture, we've built for the major sports programs, um, just a lot of the anchor retail. And this next slide, we, we actually talked a little bit about this in the small group, and we can come back to any of this, but the guys on the top are those institutional equity partners. Some of the examples of the people that, that are at our side and investing in the, in the big deals for us, all right? The 100 to $300 million development deals or, or large acquisitions. Um, Prudential, Jim Mahalso, who's a big part of this program, is just an unbelievable friend and partner to, to Styles Corporation. Um, the bottom group for a second, that's, that's kind of the, you know, the family offices that Terry started with 40 years ago, and passing the hat, you know, high net worth and individuals that say, hey, listen, I, I like real estate, I know it, I trust you, Terry, I'm in. Very simple, much more simple um, capital structures than the top guys. And then in the middle, Rockefeller, Lubert, Shorenstein, doing the biggest deal we've ever done right now, we'll talk about it with Shorenstein. These are private companies, but they act like institutions and they've got the financial backing to act like institutions. And, and you think Publix is a mistake, but they're equity investors of ours too. So they, they've 
they've got more cash flow than they know what to do with. I shouldn't say that on camera, but they, they are just fantastic um, partners in every sense. All right, so um, any of that we just covered? Yeah, I noticed on your, um, your kind of web of services, you guys didn't mention capital markets. Do you guys have in-house capital markets guys? Yeah, that yeah, so all right. And, 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 and that's really funny you say that, because I, I think I actually, as I was going through this, I said that to myself. Um, boy, they'd be upset if I, if I didn't mention them. Uh, it's a significant part of our group, and we lumped them in with asset management. David Channon uh, is a Wake Forest guy. He's just brilliant. And he, he leads all of our, um, our, our debt and, and much of our equity along with Rocco Ferreira. And, um, and then what we really try to do is empower our asset management guys to get involved in, in these portfolios. And we assign an asset manager to a development deal as soon as it's identified. We assign an asset manager to an acquisition deal as soon as it's identified. And, and those guys work hand in hand with the, with the execution teams to, to capitalize the deal and bring the, the capital stack. Anybody else? Um, what I plan on doing is just kind of rolling through. Tim's going to give me a hook. I know if I, if I run too long, I get, get going uh, without stopping um, asking for questions. But I'm going to run through office, residential, and retail. Okay, and I'm just going to give you a couple examples in each one. And, and again, try to talk a little bit, if I think about it, not only relevant about what we're doing, where we're spending our time, what, what could be a relevant project in today's marketplace, but but how's it changing? And why are we doing maybe something a little bit different today than we were doing you know, back in the day? And here's an example of back in the day. What, what we really got known for, besides downtown Fort Lauderdale, was building office parks. Okay, so, so two other examples, but the two biggest office parks in Broward County were Terry Styles Developments. <clears throat> Buy a huge piece of land, typically at a, at a really well-known cross-section of two major highways, right? And, and every year when I started, we would pluck 10 acres off of the assembly line from that 600 acres in sawgrass. And you could count on it, you could budget it. You knew you were gonna build, this is one of the nicer suburban office buildings we did back in the day, 120,000 square feet. And um, you just, it, you, you knew what was going on. And this is where people wanted to work. This is where corporations were moving. It, it was suburbia, it was um, next to the housing, next to the new housing that was happening. Um, again, the Trammell Crow days, okay, of, of office parks. And, um, and you know, what, what we were doing simultaneous to that is somewhat I showed you before. This building was CO'd. Um, this was one of the more recent ones in 2011. So 9-11, so it was CO'd right at 9-11. We were panicked because we had about a third of the building pre-leased to Bank of America and, and um, a big law firm. And, and this is the example, this is the opposite example, okay? This is the high-priced, structured, parked, urban environment of office. And in downtown Fort Lauderdale for years, at least, it was, it was financial companies, banks, um, law firms, consultant companies, accountants, okay? That's who was filling up these buildings. And um, where we've gone today, okay, and we talked a little bit about this before, is, is focused on amenities. So whether that's in the building, like I'm gonna show you next, or whether that's surrounding what you're gonna do, okay, you've gotta have amenities. What are amenities? It's, it's the ability to live right next door, right? The live, work, play. It's the, it's the ability to have a restaurant in your ground floor or directly next door. In this case in Charlotte, this is the coolest um, sub-market that we do business in by far. It's called South End and it's right south of Uptown Charlotte. Thousands, I mean, I'm telling you, 8,000, 10,000 apartments, very little office. Lots of, not, lots of retail, but not traditional retail. It's, it's funky, it's gritty. A lot of breweries, distilleries. Where do you all want to work, right? You want to work there. That's where I want to work, right? Um, I'd go back to South End in two seconds. I'd live in one of those apartments. And so we found this site. <clears throat> it's tight, and it's, and it's expensive. It's, two, it's three levels of underground parking for only 65,000 square feet. It doesn't get more expensive price per pound to build this building. Small building, right, compared to what I just showed you and what I'm about to show you. But um, right in the heart of it, so we're building at spec. It means we had no tenants, okay? Wells Fargo said, we got you. Building at spec, we've got, we passed the hat, private equity, financed it. And, and this is a terrible rendering, I'm sorry for it, but 
you talk about amenities, there's no room in here to put restaurants or bars in the building itself. They're just all around. You can walk out the front door and be at the brewery next door. But we took the roof, which has incredible views of uptown Charlotte at night especially, and we put a cool rooftop deck on it, right? I don't like the rendering again, but um, it's um, especially in Charlotte, year round, you can be outside. It's just, you've gotta be thinking about what's different in office today. And, and again, it's about amenities, whether they're around you or in your building. This is the biggest project we've ever done, uh, $300 million development deal. It's directly next door to our headquarters in downtown Fort Lauderdale. And um, you know, this, this left side uh, is, is called 201 Las Olas, 365,000 square feet office, about 17,000 square feet of retail and restaurants on the ground floor. Um, right next to it, you can see it on the right, and I'm gonna show you a much better view, is a sister twin tower, 350 units, just under 350 units, um, with a grocery store on the ground floor, okay? And a big shared, expensive, unfortunately, podium deck that both of them sit on top and that they share, right? That ULI will get all excited about because we figured out how to share this deck between two uses. Residents are there at night, office people in the day. Boy, we're making a little bet on parking. But, but heck, at the end of the day, we're building all this parking when I just said that cars are going away, right? We'll see. Um, but this is the biggest project we've ever tackled. We're doing it with Shorenstein out of San Francisco. We've, we've dealt with them, we've done business with them before. Private, but one of the largest owners of office in the country, and they understand development, and that's key for the amount of risk, the amount of leasing that has to occur here. We'll have about a third of this leased when it goes vertical this summer. We've already started tearing down the buildings. Are y'all doing anything like planning on making the parking decks a little bit taller to be vertical in the future? Yeah, so we, so we study it. We look at it a lot. We didn't do it on this, okay? Man, Stas, you're missing the boat. This wouldn't get built if we, if we move that, those floors another two feet higher on every deck. Too expensive. And um, Short-sighted, maybe, but you also always have to think about your equity, your source of equity. Are you IRR driven? Do you have to sell as soon as you, as you build? Can you afford to hold it for the next 100 years? Somehow are you doing that? If so, great. You know, go spend the extra money, take a much lower return. That's not our case here. Um, but it's a great question. We've gotta be thinking about those things and, and really trying to figure them out. You know, you gotta put Uber stops on your buildings today, right? You gotta have Kiss and drops for Uber. You gotta have multiple. Um, that's important. I'm gonna show you this just real quick as, as we're talking. Um, this will spin, I think, slowly. Is it moving? Yeah. Um, this is rough. This was put together a couple months ago. But it shows on the left the office tower, the shared deck. You can physically slide a piece of paper between the two projects, okay, except for those, those couple of decks that are shared. You do that because you, you, you wanna make sure you're always conscious of your exit. Somebody might not come in and want all of this with a grocery store, okay? What you're seeing here is the units, grocery market right on that hard corner there. You can see the words just barely, it says market. <clears throat> and one of the things that's really key is that parking deck that you see there with the helipad on top. That helicopter is actually used a lot. I, I think it's county use mainly. But that garage is 2,700 spaces. So. We're make, I just told you we're making this bet on sharing parking and how much are we gonna actually need. We're telling our tenants we can supply them three per thousand parking. But guess what, if in today's environment where office tenants are trying to put more and more people into a space, okay, maybe they need five per thousand. Well guess what, we can provide it. Because out of the 2,700, there's 1,700 available from, directly from the city. And you can go pay half the rate and literally walk across the street. We're just very lucky that that sits there. The other complication here is that the office site is on a 100-year ground lease. Also part of the reason why you can slide a piece of paper between the two and keep them separate technically. Uh, the other site we own, Fee Simple, we've owned for a couple years now. Um, last thing is that grocery store, and you, you kind of say, well, geez, that's like, the, that's like the really minor component of this, but it means a lot when there's, you know, anywhere between three and 5,000 units that are planned and popping up in downtown Fort Lauderdale. When you can claim you've got the green grocer, organic grocer in your lobby, effectively, come down the elevator into the, into the grocery store. It's a differentiating factor for us. We're excited about that. Um, and it's great for Fort Lauderdale because at the end of the day, for years, there's been no grocery store in downtown. 
and all of a sudden it's a sign that the critical mass is there for this live, work, play environment. Cody? Have you been to Tenet? Which Tenet? The grocer? Yeah, the grocer? We know it, but you don't know it. <laughs> um, you, can, you can guess who it is by, by who we are, but um, we, we do not publicize that yet. I, I, I've, I've gotten in trouble for publicizing that before. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of residential projects, and, and uh, forgive me if I'm, if I'm running uh, late. Okay, they, uh, here's the, the common theme in, the, in these multifamily buildings is that we are very conscious of where we are in the marketplace. A lot of people love to talk about what inning we're in. We talk a lot about that. You know, where are we? Where's it going? How much supply is coming? We see so much multifamily built, and so much of it, rightfully so, because it keeps filling up every time it's delivered, is aimed at you, is aimed at 20s, is aimed at 30s, young professionals. Units are getting smaller as develops, developers are pushing rents to try to combat construction costs, okay? So units get smaller, they keep all of us with the same check rate, right? Brand new project, I wanna live in that brand new project. Well, I'm gonna keep your check rate the same, tenant, by making your unit a little bit smaller. And all of a sudden we're gonna be down to a 260 square foot unit that Sam, Sam looked at at some point. Um, so we made, the, we made a bet a number of years ago with Rockefeller Group, we, we did this project. It's 250 units in downtown Fort Lauderdale. And we said we're not gonna build commodity, okay? We're gonna go the opposite way. There's no comp for it. We're going for top end of the market. We're making a bet that there's a demographic that's not being catered to right now. Whether you want to call them the empty nesters or the divorcees, it's what proved out. We delivered this, um, we not only leased immediately on the larger unit, the, the highest level of amenity, more amenity, square feet, pools, club rooms, lounges, uh, sauna, dog walks, very important, dogs to people, um, every, every deal. Um, and it not only leased immediately, pre -lease, it, we had 100 pre-leases out of 250. It was unheard of. So, you know, again, Wells Fargo, Rockefeller, they stood by us. They, we, we made this bet together. And it was an absolute home run. We sold it for a record number per foot in the southeast. Um, same, same thing, different build. This is in Raleigh. It's kind of, if, if I give you a push pin and said, find the center of Raleigh, this is right on the oldest golf course in, uh, in Raleigh. <clears throat> and I found the site. I want to do a Publix on it. Uh, everybody, everybody constantly reminds me of that. Um, and uh, we were not going to go bloodbath in Raleigh, very difficult place to rezone anything, and rezone from what our partner, current developer who owns this, Gordon Grubb, uh, already had planned, which was some units. It wasn't this many units. It wasn't this, this design. And we went and rezoned it to that, which was administrative. Um, this is stick built, so you know, can, you know, wood over a two-level underground podium, concrete podium, uh, less expensive to build, but same program, bigger units than anything in the market, more amenities per square foot than anything in the market, and we just completed this late last year. We're about half leased right now, so we're excited about this project. And then, and then once again, this is Amaray. Recreated, bigger, bigger deal, 400 units, big bet, okay, right on the river in South Florida. We're, we're coming out of the ground right now. We're working on our foundations. Um, this is Jim Mahalso and Prudential, okay, as our partner, our lifeblood. Um, they love this story. They love it, love it, love it. He's got a lot of commodity units in his portfolio. He wants this. So um, we're really excited about this. This is one of the, until the, the $300 million deal we've done, this is, this is the biggest deal we had done. So. I mean, a lot going on this year for us as far as development and uh, hard to underestimate um, what we've got out there right now. But, but again, just under 400 units, $160 million project. Um, same philosophy, going after the bigger units, uh, higher check rate. Um, quickly, retail. We all know it's changing. We all know we're spending differently. Um, I got more boxes at my front door. It drives me bananas when I come home and I see them. And, my wife and kids are grabbing them. Nothing's ever for me. Um, but everything's changing, including, you know, grocery, all right? And, and for, for the last couple of years, everyone's like, oh, well, it's all right. I'm developing grocery. I'm safe. And then Amazon buys Whole Foods, and, and everybody's got a delivery service now, and it's, it's, it's kind of crazy, right? It's changing, too. So um, 
again, this is a site that I, I probably gained 20 pounds, lost half my hair. Um, this was a deal that had a 10-story office building on it in a really dense suburb of Charlotte. It's in Charlotte. They just call it Cotswold. Very high demographic, right? Right across the street is the highest grossing Harris Teeter grocery store, their main competition in uh, Charlotte, okay? So I, I see this side, I bring it to Publix. I go, man, it's got a 10-story office building on it. It's a really ornery old guy that owns it. Um, we got a real problem rezoning it. And they're like, we'll take it. Go, Scott, whatever you gotta do, go do it. Took me two years just to get it under control. Okay, so back to your point. Two years to get this guy to believe in the fact that he's better off. By the way, he wouldn't sell it to me. 100-year ground lease. Okay, so his great-grandchildren are gonna have the picture of him over their mantle just doing this based on what Publix and Styles is paying them every year for the next 100 years. And, and what this is, I didn't describe it real well, 46,000 square foot prototype store, okay? So big, big public store, the big ones that you go into, sitting up in the air. There's two levels of parking below it. One's underground, one's at street level, okay? There was a height ordinance here, all right? I mean, talk about, so, so challenges that you just, you gotta get creative today with retail. And Publix is really good at it, and they're willing to pay the rent to, to offset these kind of costs. Um, and then uh, the only other retail project I want to show you is this is what most people tell you is dead, right? That it's not coming back, that the boxes are gone. Um, they're not wrong. They, they, they know it's coming, um, but it's not dead. Uh, companies like Home Depot, you can't get satisfied on the Internet. You can't go to top golf on the internet, you can't go to your restaurants, your fun, your fitness, the things that'll fill up the, the front spaces. Um, we don't have any furniture in here, but you're typically not buying your furniture online, right? Um, city furniture, we do an awful lot of business with. Those two deals on the left are, are long-term ground leases that really make this deal work, okay? So we, we found this 40-acre site. This site doesn't happen, but a few places in the country, I, I fully believe it. We, we are way overpaying for the dirt, but it's because of the demand. It's right across the street from the Dolphin Mall in Dade County, um, one of the highest grossing malls in the whole state. And um, it was an industrial site that Prologis had. And they said, listen, we can, we can help our industrial park too by, by adding services, entertainment, restaurant, food, kind of the old you know, office um, approach. And they sold us this site. Um, we just closed on the land yesterday. So, probably at least over a year in the making, negotiation on that. And um, because of that, you've got the, the Class A boxes that you want in each category, Dix, Ross, Michaels. Each one of them has maybe a, a second behind them that is just a little bit less credit worthy or a little bit less appealing to you to put in your center. But because of this location, we were able to you know, put this deal together. So is it changing? There's no question about it. We've got to be very conscious of it only chase the things where we think we can really make money and be confident in that it's gonna be long-term real estate. But every once in a while, you, you, you happen across the right location. Any questions about any of those product types? How do you manage your time each day between all of these you know, different market sectors and companies? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, that's not to make it sound like it's a challenge. I mean, I. I told these guys before that were with me, um, this is a tough business, right? And you gotta be ready and willing to grind it out. You're gonna have really, even when it's really good, you're gonna have real challenges, right? Um, so you just, you gotta prioritize. You gotta find a way of, of getting organized. Boy, that's, you know, thanks God, everybody knows that. I, I'm telling you, it is hard. You gotta stay really organized. Find a system, you know? I make lists. I physically handwrite lists. You know, Nick Banks has got a great little, you know, computer screen that he uses. He sat in my office last year and he showed me, he prioritizes everything based on a model and he's got four corners and, you know, this is, I forget what the model's called. It's this, you know, probably some psychologist came up with it, but it's like, this is what's priority, but, you know, I, I forget his, his metrics. Um, but you just gotta find what works for you. And I, I make lists and Terry Styles relied on my lists at some point. We went, went to breakfast every Tuesday morning um, when I came back from North Carolina. And we'd, we'd BS a little bit and we'd talk about something fun or the game last night and then he'd go, break out the list. And it, it's the only way I can do it. I've got to, I've got to write it down. I, I change it almost every single day. So um, it's not a great answer, but you, um, 
you just prioritize based on, on what you got and, and you got really good people around you. That's the other cliche. Got to have really good people. Uh, you got to trust them because there's no way you can do it all yourself. If you try to do it all yourself, you're going to fail. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so it's not going to sound like a big number because on average, we, what I didn't do a good job saying is that we also have some smaller units in there. We have some studios in there, um, probably low 800s, but on average, we're about 1170 square feet, okay? And that's a big unit on average in a multifamily deal today. Mostly you'd see an average in the 900s. Okay, so when you spread that extra square footage across your whole building, we, we've got penthouses, I, th I think I said before, ungodly numbers rent-wise, check-wise, over 3,000 square feet. Um, so, so it's an average, but, but that's a big average today, 1170. Um, what else did you say, rent check? Yeah, rent per square foot. Yeah, so, so um, I don't know much today in that high-rise configuration, structured parking, very expensive build, that you're not gonna proform three bucks a foot or higher. Three dollars a foot per month. Drives me nuts thinking about it. Um, that's from the developer who's signed, you know, signing off and said, yeah, let's go. Uh, you know, people are paying um, these kind of numbers and a lot of those commodity units, they're, they're squeezing them down against smaller so that the per foot is up, but the check right is the same or less. Again, I told you that. Um, but, but guess what? You don't have the big, a lot of these people moving into Amaray are coming out of you know, 7,000, 10,000 square foot homes. Um, talk about carry on those, talk about your taxes, talk about your maintenance, your lawn, your pool, all that stuff that you walk away from. And you, you turn the key and you go visit your kids in college, you go visit your grandkids and wherever. Um, it's, it's real. And Robert probably talked to you guys about some of this. There's nobody doing more, more multifamily than Robert. Um, by the way, how did I, I, I said to Tim, how did I get slotted behind Robert? That guy is awesome. <laughs> um, but I don't know if that answers your question. I'll tell you, for that product type, again, you can build garden stuff for a lot cheaper than that, right? Um, we can build that Raleigh deal for a lot cheaper than that. We're just over $2 a foot, for example, on that Raleigh deal. Different build, different, different deal. Anybody else before I dive into this? I want to show you this video clip of Terry. And um, <clears throat> how are we doing time-wise? Are we all right? Close? Um, uh, this, I think this is four or five minutes. I uh, hope it's not too long. But um, listen for a couple of things here, okay? And again, I made a statement. I, I want you all to find somebody like Terry um, who just holds his name at, at the highest level. He's never going to allow anybody to mess it up. Um, it's all about relationships and it's all about his people, um, about quality over profit. Is there volume? Yeah. Again, this was done for a company meeting we had, I think it was three years ago. Um, so you'll, you'll kind of see some of that blended in. But. values really started with my dad. Um, I got to work with him for three years before he passed away after I came out of college. Um, and he always stressed the fact that you always had to uh, value your name and your reputation. You all hear that? You had to value your credit, all right? And you had to value the relationships that you, you have. The company today uh, is strong because I, I think we together work as a unit, not as individuals. And, and we also, you know, believe that uh, it's not just a job. You know, people are just here for a job and they probably don't last too long. And so we, we really stress the value of hopefully being a family business. We can't lose some of the little things we do. A lot of people question why we do picnics and Christmas parties and Halloween parties and things of that nature. And to me, I think it's really important to build the fabric so people get to know each other. I think it's, it's really admirable when I'll see a, a, a pack of 
four or five of the younger people, you know, going out to lunch together or having a cocktail. I just think we need to, they need to continue with that fabric. And I, and I think the core values are, are solid. To me, it, it's something we have in our conference room. It, it's something that, that keeps us together. Um, I always say we probably don't make as much money as some other development companies. All right, but I love coming to work. And I want everybody to love to come to work. And uh, I don't want them to feel like it's a drudgery coming here. I, I want them to think it's, it's an opportunity. Uh, it's a fun place. It's a place where they can grow. It's a place where they can count on being here and that their you know, families can count on being here. We don't have a revolving door here. We look at our people first. I mean, we're a construction company, but we're nothing more than a bunch of people dealing with other people, whether it's our clients, whether it's our coworkers, whether it's our bankers, whether it's the city that we're trying to do a deal in. If you can't get that relationship going in the right direction, you're going to have a problem right up front. A long time ago, I learned that the guy that's down digging ditches and, and uh, you know, tying steel in 110 degree heat is just as important as the guy that's the CEO or the president of his company. And, and if that guy makes a mistake and the foundation of the property goes down, we're in big trouble. Right? And so everybody's got their relative importance and once you make your name bad it's bad and protect your name at all risk and um, and we've done that um, there's times we've we've written checks to make sure we've done the right thing and I, I think it's not all about money I think it's about the longevity of the company yes we want to make a decent profit um, but I, I also think that you got to do the right thing it's our people to make a, a difference. Uh, <laughs> cliche. And I just want to close saying that uh, that's a fact. Uh, it, it is our people, and it's, it's how our people treat other people, as I mentioned earlier. And I just want to thank everybody that's here. Um, we had a great year, but I just want to say thank you. I thank you for the support that I was given because of my health issues. But more importantly, I, I, I thank you for being what makes this company better than any other development company that I know, and that's the fabric of our people. So I thank you. All right, well, thanks, everybody, for letting me show that. I, there's one other thing that he said in there that I really wanted to make the point, and it's, it's about integrity, just doing the right thing, start to finish. You specifically, whether you're, you're, you're working for, whoever you're working for, do the right thing. You're going to have a very long career, but you build your reputation. You damage it once, it's very hard to get it back. So just um, those words of wisdom. Terry talked about our core values, and this is something we, we just focus on a lot. Um, you can read them here, but um, we, we talk about it, we dwell on them. Each one of these has a dozen bullet points underneath them, talking about how we, we treat each other, how we, um, you know, again, protect our reputation, um, focus on integrity. You know, the last one's kind of important. I mean, Terry would tell you, it's, family will tell you, we're, we're, we're okay. Styles family's okay. We've got to grow. We've got to continue to build. We've got to continue to be successful so that the rest of our 320 people can succeed. Um, so again, we, we really focus on these core values that, that, that Terry was kind of running through in that video ran through. Um, very quickly, I'm going to run through some of these. Um, this is just my, you know, my, my ending here. These are really important to me. Um, and again, your, your job, we spent a little time on this before, it was a really good question from somebody, I forget who it was, but, but your job is to go figure out who your next boss and your next boss after that, what's important to them, okay? And, um, and you'll, you'll shift, you'll pivot based on prioritizing what you need to do in your job. You never lose who you are and what, what, you, what, is, what is absolutely um, uh, what makes you who you are and stand by your, your principles. But you got to go figure that out. And, and some of these are mine. Um, we just don't have a lot of egos in our shop. Everybody's got an ego, technically. Somebody will correct me and tell me that. But we check them at the door. And I'll tell you, people that, that come in pretty, pretty hot and arrogant, they're just, they're just not a fit for us. And so um, this is bigger. This is life. This is treat everybody the same. That's Terry's thing. I mean, Everybody's treated the same. And so go get to know your security guard in the ground floor of your building and your boss's assistant and, and, and be very conscious of everybody. Not because those people are, are going to find a way 
to relay good or bad things about you to people that matter, but because that's what you should do, okay? Oop. There you go. Work harder than everybody. Scott, don't tell me that. I hear that all the time. Please don't tell me that. It's true. Work harder than everyone. Be competitive about it, okay? Um, we talk about grinding it out in our shop, and you've got to be willing to go grind, especially in the beginning. You got to work really hard. <clears throat> And that should never stop, by the way. Yeah, you, you earn your, your keep and, you, and you, you feel good about your position. It should actually get, your, your work ethic should grow as you grow in your positions. Um, work against this millennial reputation, okay? Work against it. Because everybody in this room doesn't fit that reputation, I'm telling you. Um, but you, but you got your work cut out for you. I was Generation X, I am Generation X. We were the laziest generation, that was our title. Um, I don't believe it, um, we definitely could have been. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but to that point, I went to Wayne Huizenga's funeral, Mr. Wayne Huizenga's funeral, a couple weeks ago. And anybody not know who Mr. Huizenga was, he, I think he was the only person that ever started three Fortune 500 companies. He owned all three major sports teams in, in the state of Florida at the same time. This was right on his service card, okay, on his mass card. Um, and it just, they talk about humble and kind. This is one of the kindest guys you've ever met, most charitable guys you've ever met. And, and that's his tagline, right on his service card. Um, be patient, okay, um, just learn, all right? You're gonna feel a lot of anxiety. I know I did multiple times in my career, especially when they asked me to move over to development. I was like, I'm out of here, I'm, I'm jumping. But, I was thoughtful about it. I trusted the people that were telling me to, to make this change. Put your head down and learn as much as you can, especially in the beginning. You will not regret it. Don't move too quick. I'm not telling you to do what I did, but, but learn, okay? Just find opportunities to learn and absorb. Communicate well. Okay, this might be obvious, but, but if you don't like public speaking, if you don't know how to write a good letter, if you can't make a good argument in that letter, go take a class, go figure it out. All of you do, I know it. Um, you're coming out of this program, but, but don't ever forget, communication's everything. It's first impressions, and it's hard to, to get that back. Find an advisor. Um, this one's really important to me. I found a very close friend outside of work and outside of family that I can go to for advice, okay? And he's an older, older, he'd, he'd hate me. He's just a few years older than me, but he's, he's more advanced than his family. His kids are four or five years older than mine. Um, you're gonna need someone to run things through, okay? Just pure and simple. And find an advisor, find somebody you trust that you can compare notes with. This person is actually our main lender uh, at Styles, and he's, he's one of my closest friends. Um, be old school. Uh, this isn't the movie. This isn't come back and join your fraternity again. Um, <laughs> Dr. Tosi, I don't know if, if, you get, if maybe Dr. Archer remembers him. He was in the, in the MBA class. He talked, it was a class called Power and Politics. It was a management class, and he talked about the old Turks, okay, the old guard, excuse me, the old guard and the young Turks, okay? The guys that have been in the business for a long time and the new young bucks, the shining stars coming in. And there is a, you know, a tried and true, um, you know, issue here between the two. And, you know, again, I started by saying this, cater to the old guard, figure out what they want. Come in eventually, prove your keep, and start making changes where you see fit. You know, Ken Stiles and I are doing things different than his dad and Doug Egan did, but we're not wiping the slate, and we never did, certainly in our early careers, right? We did as Terry wanted us to do, and that might be dress, it might be hours, it might be much bigger things, philosophy on the business, taking the business in new directions, but, but remember, be old school, and some of those things, I gave the example before, this is a very small one, I hired my replacement in Charlotte because I sat with him for a good hour and a half and I, I could see his work ethic, I could see um, his grind, he wanted to jump right in. And when I got back to Fort Lauderdale a day and a half later, I had a, a, an old school handwritten note on my desk. I, it's something that's important to me, I loved it. Um, I've gotten them from some of you. I just, I, I'm telling you, it goes a long way. Can figure out what old school means and be it. Get greedy. Um, you know, this is, uh, we use this term a lot, and we kind of, we kind of, we, we don't have a, a gritty award, but we should. We look for people that can just persevere, okay? And there's, there's a great book by Angela Duckworth. She studied this. She's a 
who's a management consultant by trade, but she got into inner city schools and she studied children. Who gets grit? Who gets the ability to persevere and have passion and hard work and who doesn't? Is it learned? Is it, is it not? Um, but you know what, what I take it to mean is being able to get through tough times. Go fight through it yourself before you gotta go rely on somebody else. Be curious. Um, I talked about this maybe a little bit before, maybe that was the previous class, but if Aaron is, is pulling in an acquisition deal for us and Dave Channon, who I mentioned before, is, is going and putting together the capital stack, Aaron should go take an hour of Dave's time and go figure out what Dave's doing. That's his teammate, that's his role. He's supposed to be doing that. Aaron's supposed to be looking at the next acquisition deal, right? But we want Aaron to be curious. We want him to go round out his skill sets. And the people that really advance in their careers are very curious. Get involved, we talked about this program, but, but when you do get involved, ICSE, ULI, NAOP, whatever it is, don't just go to the meetings and pay your 10 bucks or you know, 100 bucks for the year. Immediately get in, join a committee. I, hey, can I help you fundraise? Can I, can I go help you set up for the company meeting or the annual meeting? Can I be your membership chair? Um, Again, the old guard loves that. They love it, love it, love it. Do it immediately and you won't regret it. You'll regret it if you don't. And then again, lastly, tough business. I'm constantly saying my prayers, all right? You guys gotta find your source of, source of strength. Um, you're gonna love this business. You're gonna never regret it, I'm telling you. But you're gonna have times um, that are really tough and you wanna be with good people, good partners, and have good advisors, and, and you're gonna do fantastic. That's what I've got. Any questions beyond what we've talked about? Kept you way later, huh, than we thought. Scott, thank you so much for coming. You're welcome, thank you.